today. Well, the message this morning is from John, and it's coming from the message. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Listen to the word of God, and it's Jesus who is speaking on that last night. Jesus said these things, and then raising his eyes in prayer, he said, Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your son, so the sun in turn may show your bright splendor. You put him in charge of everything human, so he might give real and eternal life to all in his charge. And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I glorified you on earth, by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. I spelled out your character in detail to the men and women you gave me. They were yours in the first place. Then you gave them to me and they have now done what you said. They now know beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them, and they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours, and yours mine. And my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me so they can be one heart and one mind. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Won't you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here be acceptable for, to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I tried to really point it out. Did you hear those words? I pray for them. Jesus was praying for each one of his disciples, for us, because we're his disciples, for you and for me. What a powerful thought. I hadn't really thought about that before. Someone is praying for me, for you, for us, and that someone is Jesus. When we hear someone say it, I'll pray for you, do you wonder if they really will? Is it going to really make a difference? Or is it just something that gets passed off? You know, the words you need to say at certain times. Well, last September at the Meadows, we had the privilege to have a Catholic brother bring communion to the Catholic folk. Picture a tall gentleman, big. This was Brother Paul personifying the Irish, well, not a leprechaun because he was too big, but the Irishman, full of personality. And we all fell in love with him right away. Little did we know that he was battling cancer and that he would not be with us for much longer. But one thing that he always did wherever he went was he would say, God bless you. Please pray for me. I thought that was a little bit odd, but with his smile and his outgoing personality, we took everything with him. But when we learned he would not be able to return to us, hopefully being a little bit on the funny side, I asked people who were there at that service that day to gather around the communion table and to show him we were indeed praying for him. We did take a moment to pray for him, and then I had them 
put their hands up, and pray. And I took their picture, thinking that maybe he might appreciate, I thought, humor a little of us praying for him, and it would encourage him. Well, I printed the picture, deposited it in his mailbox, and by that point, he was not accepting any visitors, so I never really saw what his reaction was to it. But later on, when I was speaking with his sister at his funeral, I found out that that picture had been extremely treasured by him. He had it at the end of his bed so he could see it continually, and it encouraged him so much through his last days. Who knew? That was a lesson for me, that prayer does make a difference, and it definitely made a difference for Brother Paul. And his sister wanted the same picture because she found it encouraging. It was just a picture, but I confess that when I took it and I look at it, even now, I can still see and feel a power of prayer coming from it, and it impacts me as well. Now, I wanted to be able to share it up here, but because I didn't ask permission from everybody, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so I apologize. You'll just have to take my word that that picture and pictures can impact us. I'll pray for you. How often do we say those words when we're told of some challenge a friend or acquaintance is facing? So what did Jesus pray for? Well, he prayed that we would know the joy that he has in our knowledge of him, that we can trust the truth that he did come from God and that God did send him, that the words that he spoke would have meaning for each one of us, impacting our daily life as we live it, so others would be able to see his presence in our lives. Jesus knows that. By the life he lived, his disciples show the effect that he had on their lives and still do on ours. His teachings may seem repetitive at times, but sometimes that's what it takes for us to believe and take it in. I'm reminded of good old Peter. Uh, one of the times when he was out on the Sea of Galilee and there was a huge storm that came up and Jesus was walking across the lake and Peter called out to him and said, I want to walk on the water too. Jesus said, come on. So Peter came out and was doing fine until he took his eyes off of Jesus. And then what happened? Boink! Down he went. So Jesus had to help him get back to the boat. <sighs> Peter. Then there was um, a few others. Well, actually with Peter... Jesus was pretty good with him because he allowed Peter to make mistakes, which he definitely did, and he still hang, hung on to him as his friend and as his companion and as his supporter. He never let go of Peter no matter what. And as a result, Peter's faith was able to grow. Then there was Thomas. You know, Thomas who doubted the resurrection of Jesus until Jesus appeared to him in person inviting Thomas to put his hands in the wounds from the crucifixion. Jesus didn't turn away from him or his doubt. He followed through and stayed right with him. Then how about the two brothers, James and John, who wanted to sit next to Jesus when Jesus went to heaven, one on his right and one on his left. Position was power in their minds. But his relationship, Jesus' relationship with them, and the world wasn't about power, but about the message that they had been entrusted to, to give to the world. These were the disciples of Jesus, and he was there for each one, even when they veered off course. I don't know about you, but I tend to do that a bit. <laughs> but in this prayer, Jesus is praying for his disciples, and he knows all this. He prays focused on them. He knows what they need, and what we need as well. He asks for God to guard them from the evil one. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't like to think about Satan or the evil one prowling around looking for someone who might be weak, hurting, or in trouble, the absolute perfect victim. Don't like Satan. 
Matter of fact, Satan's way over there, not part of my mindset normally. But Jesus wasn't one to avoid the thought of the evil one, though perhaps I should pay attention. Hmm. Do you listen to the Lord's Prayer that Jesus himself gave us? He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Ooh, how easy is it to fly right past that one? Jesus gave that prayer to us and must have felt that guarding, delivering us from evil, as he included that same request to us. Hadn't really thought about it, hadn't stood out in my mind. Anyway, there's a number of folk here from the Meadows. I'm not there anymore, unfortunately. But they've been with me at the Meadows, and they know of my delight in the words of Louis Giglio, who has written a book, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. It's time to win the battle of your mind. Hmm. In it, he speaks of the 23rd Psalm, which says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God's table for us, even in the presence of our enemies. Who are those enemies? Well, my eyes and ears were open when I listened to a Catholic priest once talk about who the enemies were. He said, you know, you don't think about it, but our enemies are worry, anxiety. They can be anger. They can be doubt, fear, or anything else that affects our mind. And Louis Giglio says, don't let them have a seat at our table. That's not what our table is for. Hmm. Those are evils. It's our table, physically or mentally, where we turn to be fed by God. And with the help of Jesus, we are safe. We don't have to allow the enemy a place in our minds, in our lives, at our table. That's kind of a powerful image, isn't it? We don't have to give that enemy a place at our table. Well, I'm filled with images today, and I'm afraid you'll have to just kind of go along with me. But another picture that enters my mind when I think of being guarded is that of Jesus decked out in armor with a sword standing before me somewhere, like ready to do battle like a knight of old for me and my mind. How many of you watched the coronation of King Charles? Well, some of us did. <laughs> I have to admit I had to watch it. Didn't quite get it, but two, but I had to watch the whole thing. And the vision that I thought about with the sword and all the rest that was acted out was when William, Prince of Wales, pledged his loyalty to his father and faith and truth that he would bear unto him as his liege man of life and limb, so help me God. And then after taking the vow, he paid homage to his father, touched his father's crown, and then kissed his cheek. You knew it was heartfelt. But Jesus is doing the same thing. He's offering his protection to us the same as William did to his father. Hmm. I confess that when things start getting out of hand, I do imagine Jesus standing there before me, ready to do battle for me, to guard me, and it brings me a sense of peace. It does. Maybe it's at night when I can't sleep, and I think of Jesus there, and I say, get rid of these thoughts or whatever it is that's getting in the way of my mind. And peace often, maybe not always, I have to work hard at this sometimes and have Jesus work hard, extra hard, <laughs> but I get peace so that I can get to sleep. Yes, prayer does change things, sometimes me, sometimes situations I find myself in, but prayer changes things. Sometimes I need help with the prayer part, however, especially when I get down or stuck. That's when it's very good to know that there's someone else praying for me when I can't seem to muster up the energy or the words to do it for myself. Last Sunday, I stopped by my home church in Benicia on my way up to preach up here to another church, and I had to drop something off. 
But as I was leaving, a dear man that's in the choir, he's in his 80s, he can't see very well, and he has everything blown up big for him, but he has a glorious voice. He saw me, he said, aren't you staying, Kay? Because I try to sing with the choir when I can. I said, no, I can't, I'm sorry. I'm heading off to this other church to lead worship. He said, hold it, stop. And with that, he prayed a blessing on me. Nothing I was asking for, but wow. Totally unexpected, freely given, unasked for, and it put me in such a good place as I headed out to hear, to know that someone was praying for me. I didn't ever have that much of an experience on it until maybe, oh wow, 30 or 40 years ago when I was working a conference and people prayed for me before I went on. And I have never had anybody pray for me. I don't know if you have the same experience, but it's not part of it. Pray for me, Lord Jesus. Well, I could do many sermons on prayer, but today I just wanted to give you and me the opportunity to consider that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is praying for us even now, praying that we may be protected, guarded, and most importantly, keep his message alive in our lives, to be seen by the world, that we may be made one with God, as God is one with and through Jesus in us. What a gift. Jesus prays for us, and we can follow his example by praying for each other. Pray for each other? What can we pray? I'm not very good at praying. How about for the knowledge of God's presence within? For kindness of speech in whatever situation arises? For love and compassion for each other? For help to be given when facing various challenges, be they health or mental challenges related to loss? For spiritual and emotional growth in faith? for protection, for contentment, for hope, for peace within, for joy, for appreciation of the world around us. There's so much we can pray for as a gift to someone else. And prayers best come from our heart, don't they? Stating what we hope for that person for whom we are praying, be it friend, be it people we don't know, be it our children or our grandchildren, the preschool kids. But in the end, we always allow God to determine what God deems best. So I ask, who's praying for you? Jesus is, and many others can as well. Here's the kicker. If we allow them to do so, it's not a weakness to be open to ask for prayer for ourselves. As so often I hear, oh, I don't need anything. Just saying. But if we can participate in praying for others as well, be it our friends or whomever, it just might surprise us what God can do for them and for us. Look what Jesus did and what he still is doing. And so I ask you to remember just who is praying for you in his own words. Jesus. And then others. As Brother Paul used to say, pray for me and may God bless you all. Amen. <laughs>